All right. Very good evening, everyone. Welcome to ISC Masterclass. Uh, this is the 11th edition of uh, ISC Masterclass. We had a wonderful lecture last week uh, by Dr. Raju Sarma on how do you assess or how do you image a liver SOL. And all of you will agree that uh, this was a remarkable uh, lecture by Dr. Raju Sarma. We received a lot of uh, feedback and uh, and a uh, lot of questions and uh, we thank again Dr. Raju Sarma for a wonderful talk. Same in this series, taking liver SOL further, uh, we have uh, 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 one other talk today that is uh, how do you manage hepatocellular carcinoma and uh, this is a common issue and all of us deal in our practice day to day and for this uh, we have a uh, uh, a great speaker. Uh, his name is Dr. Anil Arora. Uh, he is uh, very popular. Uh, he is a uh, head of the department of gastroenterology at uh, Sir Gangaram Hospital uh, in New Delhi. Uh, he has uh, uh, he has a wide number of publications, and his uh, his knowledge is uh, uh, is remarkable. Very humble, very good to talk to, and uh, very methodical. We are going to have a treat. Uh, listening to him today on hepatocellular carcinoma. In addition, we have a, a two moderators today. Uh, we have Dr. Krishna Das, uh, who is from Government Medical College Trivendram. And we have Dr. Ajay Jain. Uh, he is a, a head of department of uh, gastroenterology at the Chaitram Hospital in Indore. So welcome Dr. Arora, welcome Dr. Krishna Das, welcome Dr. Jain. Uh, we look forward to listen to you. And now I hand over to Dr. Saraswat to welcome you formally and, and take lecture forward. Dr. Saraswat, please. Thank you, Dr. Govind. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, it's a great pleasure to have all of you attend and participate in the ongoing ISG Masterclass series, uh, which, as Dr. Govind has uh, told you, is finding continued popularity amongst all the residents and the um, gastroenterologist, hepatologist community in the country. As uh, has been discussed on previous occasions, we do have participation and audience tuning in from our neighboring countries, distant countries from Africa as well as South Asia, and uh, the and good feedback from all of them. As uh, Govind has mentioned, the speaker for this evening is uh, Professor Anil Arora. Anil Arora is a well-known speaker I think he organized one of the most popular annual meetings, which has been probably been running now for almost 15 years, if I'm not wrong, the annual Gangaram meeting to which uh, many of us in which many of us have participated and which is popular with the audience as well as with the speakers. He's a prolific author is as well as a, a popular speaker. And other than that, uh, my I have been knowing and I've been interacting with him for almost uh, 35 years. He, when I was leaving the Department of Gastroenterology after finishing my DM at the All India Institute, Anil was uh, walking in. Probably he might well have occupied the seat that I vacated in the uh, department when he joined the department. And as a past president of the ANASL, he's also been very active in academics as well as now a member of the governing council of the Indian Society of uh, Gastroenterology. With these few words, I would uh, request uh, Professor Arora to begin his lecture for the evening on hepatocellular carcinoma. Dr. Arora, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Saraswat. First of all, let me be very grateful to our team of uh, Dr. Vivek Saraswat and Dr. Govind Makarya for having given me this opportunity. I am blessed to be presenting the topic in front of my teacher, philosopher and guide, Professor Saraswat, as well as uh, my colleague from Alma Mater, Dr. Govind Makarya. The topic of my presentation is management of hepatocellular carcinoma. I am going to discuss briefly about the epidemiology of the disease, the etiological factors which are relevant as of today, how do we do the surveillance for diagnosis of early HCC? Because it is important to understand, unless we diagnose the disease in the early stage, further treatment is futile. How do we establish the diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma, especially in a complex situation of 
cirrhosis of the liver and once you have been able to diagnose what are the current modalities for management of the disease finally i'll end up by telling you how to prevent the disease as i sincerely believe that 80% of the hcc which is present today is manageable to prevention alone and finally we'll have a glimpse into the future therapies hepatocellular carcinoma is the fourth most common cancer causing mortality in the world two thirds of the patients with hcc tend to remain localized in the asia pacific and sub saharan africa region the five year survival of the disease is pretty dismal as majority of those who present to you for the first time they present you in advanced disease except in a country like japan who have uh, the country which has an excellent surveillance program as of today 30% of their newly diagnosed hcc patients are in the stage early stage of the disease which is curative this is the typical presentation which we have today in day to day practice in india first time presentation comes with extensive involvement of the vascular system and this is a case we reported in which the first presentation of the patient with hcc was bud carey syndrome because the tumor had infiltrated into the right hepatic vein and subsequently into the inferior vena cava what is the etiology of hcc both cirrhotic and non cirrhotic patient can lead to development of hepatocellular carcinoma hepatitis b hepatitis c nash and alcohol are the front runners for causation of cirrhosis which leads to development of hcc in addition to the list of other causes which i mentioned here i think it is important also to remember there are non cirrhotic conditions like hepatitis b c and nfld which lead to development of hcc in fact in the natural history of hepat in the cirrhosis of the liver about one third of the patient will de develop hepatocellular carcinoma and this rate is variable depending upon the etiology of the disease and it varies between 1.5 to 3% per year and this is the etiological breakup and if you see hepatitis b hepatitis c alcohol and obesity and as i have mentioned i sincerely believe we can tackle all of this and prevent the menace of hepatocellular carcinoma which is running havoc in society of hepatologists we reported this data of 140 patients from our center in which we have shown that hepatitis b tends to cause cirrhosis of the liver as well as hepatocellular carcinoma much earlier than the other etiological reasons how does a patient with hepatitis b c or alcohol result in formation of hepatocellular carcinoma there are two mechanisms all these patients with hepatitis b c and alcohol they can produce hepatocellular malignancy by causing first inflammation fibrosis cirrhosis and during this process of inflammation and fibrosis there is an incidental and accidental damage to the dna mitochondria resulting in endoplasmic reticular reticular stress in addition at least two viruses hepatitis b and c are known to induce both the genetic and epigenetic changes and hence can lead to development of hepatocellular carcinoma bypassing the development of cirrhosis of the liver so do we need to have surveillance in hepatocellular carcinoma answer is yes for any disease to have surveillance you need to have some specified criteria and this criteria include that the disease has to be common the more diagnostic modality should be affordable it should be acceptable by the general pop population it should be effective in treatment of the early disease which we have picked up by this diagnostic modality and incidence should be good fortunately for us hcc fulfills all this criteria that means the incidence is more than 1.5% per year and you gain at least 100 days that is 3 months of longevity at a cost of less than 50000 us dollar per year gain in the life in hepatocellular carcinoma so which patients need surveillance with hepatocellular carcinoma the first and foremost is all cirrhotic should be screened for for uh, uh, incidental hcc on surveillance except the patient who are in the child c and who are not uh, ready for liver transplantation in subgroup of the non cirrhotic patient all patient with hepatitis b who have active inflammation who have a family history of hcc who have uh, uh, age of more than 40 years in males and have asian or african descent should be screened for hepatitis b in fact there is also a recent suggestion that patient with advanced fibrosis and 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 nfld in the in the form of nash are also likely to have higher incidence of development of hepatocellular carcinoma how do we do the surveillance there are two methodologies which are available serological and radiological in serological serological the most important modality is the alpha fetoprotein whereas in 
radiology, the best modality is ultraspinography. Let me tell you something which is so important about alpha fetoprotein. 10 to 20 percent of the patients with hepatocellular carcinoma at a stage where a surveillance is picking up the tumor will be positive for hepatocellular carcinoma. In addition, patient, levels of alpha fetoprotein will be abnormal because of the disease activity in hepatitis B and C and because of the regenerative capacity of the liver. So these livers may be abnormal. Alpha fetoprotein, if you add it up to the ultrasound in diagnosis and increasing the sensitivity of ultrasonography for picking up early HCC, it only adds up 6 to 8 percent. And we still do not know what cutoff you use. If you use a lower cutoff, you have high sensitivity, low specificity. If you use a higher cutoff, you have higher specificity and lower sensitivity. And hence, all these three major international guidelines for surveillance in HCC still do not give a clear answer. But in practice, we still tend to use because it's easily available. The next best method for surveillance, in fact, the best method today for surveillance of HCC is the, is the ultrasonography, which is cheap, easily available, is cost effective, and uh, uh, has a good overall pool sensitivity for diagnosis of HCC. The size of the tumor which is picked up by ultrasonography is extremely important. Even though it picks up the smaller lesion at a much lower sensitivity level than the bigger lesion, but overall pool sensitivity is high. And there is an excellent study published from China in which even though the compliance with this type of sequencing and, the com and the surveillance program was only 57%, but this is the best study ever published in hepatitis B positive patient, which has clearly shown that if you follow up these patients over a long period of time, uh, there is a 37% reduction in, uh, in the mortality of HCC, primarily related to early detection by ultrasonography. And uh, uh, these are the patients who are amenable to surgery. So what do we do to the patients who are incidentally uh, found to be positive for hepatocellular carcinoma as seen on ultrasonography? There are three modalities which are available to us, contrast enhanced ultrasound, CT scan, and MRI. MRI and CT scan, there is nothing to choose between the two except the good data shows that MRI, especially if you are using a hepatospecific contrast or using a diffusion-weighted imaging, gives you better results if you are trying to pick up a lesion which is smaller than 2 centimeter in size. And this is just the data of all size versus less than 2 centimeter tumor. If you see the specificity of all three modalities, Contrast enhanced ultrasound, CT and MRI are equipotent in diagnosis, whereas in tumor less than 2 cm, certainly MRI scores over other. And hence, all international guidelines do tell us there is not, not too much to choose between the two modalities. How do we diagnose hepatocellular carcinoma? In fact, this is the only malignancy which does not require a tissue diagnosis for confirmation of the lesion. You can make a radiological diagnosis, but you need to understand the prerequisites. These prerequisites are that you need to have an underlying cirrhosis, you need to have a lesion which is more than one centimeter in size, and you need to have a lesion which shows at arterial phase hyper enhancement and a venous vas out. This is the arterial phase hyper enhancement and a uh, portal vein wash out. If you can satisfy these criteria in a cirrhotic patient, you don't need to have a biopsy. And recently, we have started using this LIRAD uh, testing, which is the liver imaging reporting analysis and data reporting. So this is the method by which we have been reporting the various type of liver as well seen in patient with cirrhosis of the liver. Suffice this to say that if you have a diagnosis of L1, LR1 and 2, you are absolutely certain that you are ruling out a malignant lesion. If you are having a lesion which is LR5, you are absolutely certain that you are talking of HCC. Intermediary lesion need to have something which needs to be done. So this is the way LIRAD is reported. If you look at this slide, it looks very intimidating, very busy. But just two points are there in the slide which I'll try to uh, impress upon. The first and foremost is that you need to have arterial phase hyper enhancement to call it HCC. So any lesion irrespective of the size, if it does not have APHE, it cannot be HCC. Second is any lesion which is, it has to be more than one centimeter. So any lesion which is less than one centimeter, even if it shows arterial phase en enhancement, cannot be HCC. So for HCC to be diagnosed radiologically, you have to have a lesion which is more than one centimeter and has to have all features which are established. We recently published these LIRAD guidelines uh, with, in association with the Indian Society of Radiology, but somehow still I do not know why these are still put in the cupboard and most of us have not been using it. 
what do we do to a lesion which is less than 1 cm or more than 1 cm which is picked up incidentally on ultrasonography if it is less than 1 cm i said it cannot be called hcc so you just follow it up after 4 to 6 months repeat an ultrasound if that is normal then you can repeat it again after 4 months but if the ultrasound image shows a change in the pattern of the lesion or if it increases in the size then you have to do one of the confirming modalities and these include other radiological in investigation like mri or contrast in ct scan so if any of these either a ct or mri shows classical features of arterial enhancement and portal venous washout you can confirm a diagnosis of hcc if one of the modality is negative you can choose second if both are negative still you should do a biopsy in a lesion which is more than 1 cm only if the biopsy is negative you can just follow it up for a period of time the important message for this is it is important to remember that there is an exponential poor prognosis after 2 cm anything beyond 2 cm there is an exponential spread of the lesion in the vicinity and vascular involvement so diagnosis at a stage up to 2 cm earlier is extremely important so these are the indications for a biopsy any lesion which is indeterminate or any lesion which uh, is not conclusive on radiology needs a biopsy and once a biopsy has been obtained we need to do the staging of the disease for staging of the disease we need to have assessment of the tumor size performance status and the liver function so on paper we have this excellent bclc staging that's barcelona clinic of liver cancer staging which gives you excellent answer so you have early stage you have uh, intermediate stage you have advanced stage and a terminal stage and with a clear cut survival advantage 60 months 30 months 10 months and 3 months very easy to remember so why should we have fuss about managing hepatocellular carcinoma just uh, look at this uh, slide and start treating but problem we should understand hepatocellular carcinoma is a heterogeneous disease one size does not fit all and you just cannot look at this slide and start treating the patient and hence there are three important messages for and we should understand that it, there are parathenses and parenthesis put in these uh, uh, slide which say the performance status and preserved liver function and optimal surgical candidacy this is something which we have to understand as a hepatologist rather than just using the slide for management starting with the performance status ecog status that is european cooperative oncology group what what is it i think this is a very good cartoon to understand what does it mean ecog means would mean that a person is absolutely normal you rush rush to office for working ecog one is when the person is not able to do the strenuous work and can do a light office work and i think most of us as consultants who are not going to the senior consultants who are not going to our ward these days are possibly in the ecog one state in ecog two status you are not going to the office but then you are able to take care of yourself completely in ecog 3 more than 50% of the times you are confined to the bed ecog 4 you are completely confined to the bed you are not able to take care of your own self and finally ecog is the stage of death preserved liver function means is ctp of 8 or ctp b of less than 8 without ascites whereas optimal surgical candidacy means you should ensure that the patient's mor mortality should be less than 3% morbidity should be less than 20% and the post op surgical risk that is decompensation should be less than 5% so how do we manage based on these modalities we need to have a multi speciality team which takes into consideration the availability of the local modalities for treatment consensus on the different modalities which are available and fortunately we have lucky to have a zoom based tumor board meeting in sagangaram hospital for almost 2 years requiring the services of both the national and the international faculty to give the best to our patient we come back to the same slide again and to start the managing patient in the early or very early hcc we need to have curative therapy that is this is the subgroup of the patient who can be cured the various modalities include ablation surgery and liver transplantation starting with ablation therapy the first and foremost is the percutaneous ethanol injection and i am happy to inform you that our professor acharya at aims was a proponent of this therapy which causes coagulation necrochemical coagulation necrosis of the lesion and is very effective up to a tumor size of about 2 cm radio frequency ablation is the standard of care in ablative therapy it gives you heat generated coagulation necrosis but it has a limitation of not being useful in patients who have a lesion which has a arterial or the venous vessel going along along it because of the heat sink effect 
and but it is better than PEI, especially if the lesion is more than two centimeter. Microwave ablation is another technique which has recently come into being. It uses electro electromagnetic energy to give you higher temperature. It is there is no problem of the heat sink effect, unlike in radio frequency ablation. But only thing is because of the cost and because of the prospective trial not showing its benefit over and above RFA, we still use RFA as the treatment of choice for ablative therapy. Then recently there is a new modality called high intensity focused ultrasound. This is a new technique. If it is established well, then this could be even at primary center using a single ultrasound probe, even at the time of diagnosis of HCC, if a person can be trained, you can do a curative therapy right there at the time of diagnosis. With that, I think we'll take a break. Uh, we'll have uh, one question. Uh, can I present the question, Professor Sarap? Yeah, I think we can see the question. Yeah, the question is uh, the diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma can be made radiologically in the presence of all except the options are A, arterial enhancement, hyper, arterial hyper enhancement, second, portal venous washout, third, underlying cirrhosis, and fourth, size less than one centimeter. With that, I'll stop sharing my screen and come back to uh, Professor Vivek and Dr. Govind. So uh, you can respond to this uh, question, questionnaire. Amol, if you have answer to that question. And uh, do we have a poll result? I will get the poll result soon. But meanwhile, Dr. Krishnadas, you can start the some of the, well, you've got a lot of questions. Yeah. So maybe we ask some questions here. Dr. Anil, wonderful talk till now. And we have a few questions for you. Can I go on with the questions? Yeah. Dr. Anil, are you audible? Yeah. Uh, Please. First question Please. is from Patna by Dr. Vijay Shankar. Is there any role of combining tumor markers in diagnosis or screening of axis? Yeah. <clears throat> in fact, uh, for there are two ways of looking at this question. If you want to do the surveillance, diagnostic markers do not have any role. There is a new upcoming concept of liquid biopsy. This is a publication I'll be showing from Dr. Arun Sanyal's group that using eight MRI, MIRNAs and 1955 signatures of the genes, now using an extracellular vesicle assessment of the DNA and RNAs, Within the blood and the urine, you can have a 98% specificity and specificity sensitivity of diagnosis. As of now, if you want to use PIVCA2 and DCP and alpha fetoprotein L3 fraction, it is useful only to assess recurrence of the lesion after curative therapy or to diagnose advanced disease. They have no role in diagnosis of early disease. Okay, so another question is regarding treatment. You have mentioned that there is uh, RFA is better than the microwave. The question was, so which is better for a three centimeter lesion? Is it RFA or a second generation microwave? This is where Dr. Nibin from Javan. There is no doubt up to three centimeter, all ablative therapies are uh, equally good. PEI uh, is, that is alcohol uh, injection is useful up to two centimeter. Beyond three cent, beyond two centimeter, up to three centimeter, RWA and microwave ablation are equally good. Advantages of microwave ablation are that if it, doesn't, it does not have the you don't need to have a plate for uh, contraction of the current and there is no heat sink effect. But prospective trials have not shown the utility of MWA over the RFA. And because of the cost benefit, we still prefer RFA. Okay, sir. Uh, next question is from Dr. Anil Kumar from Mysore. This is about screening. In patients with HPV without cirrhosis, when should you start screening? Absolutely. I told you any patient, we have given clear answers to that. Any patient who has a persistent inflammation, males more than 40 years of age, age and family history of hepatocellular carcinoma, African ascent. These are the patients who need uh, regular counseling, uh, regular screening. So age more than 40 years, family history of hepatocellular carcinoma, in the absence of the cirrhosis, do need screening and surveillance. And the question is from Calcutta by Dr. Bhavik Shah. Is there any role of PET in the diagnosis of one centimeter HC? Very good question. You see, the problem is, if you look at the total spectrum of hepatocellular carcinoma, PET will pick up only about 40 to 50% of the patients. 
well differentiated hcc if you see the way i have shown you the hepatocarcinogenesis hcc developed from a dysplastic nodule which occurred because of the persistent inflammation so the first diagnosis will be well differentiated carcinoma and then in them majority of the time pet will be negative so by the time pet is positive you already have a poorly differentiated carcinoma of there is or there is evidence of extra hepatic or vascular invasion so pet has no role in diagnosis of early hcc very clear again for screening and surveillance from prashna anurvan from dibruga is there a need for surveillance for hcc in a non cirrhotic patient with portal vein thrombosis in portal vein thrombosis yeah in a non cirrhotic patient with portal vein thrombosis no is no. there a need for surveillance so if see non if there is no cirrhosis of the liver then it depends on the etiology of the portal vein thrombosis most of the time you will i look for a hypercoagulable state rather than trying to screen for hcc in a situation like this another question on staging from dr aditya kale from uh, mumbai which is the better staging system to be used in india bclc or hklc i think the, most of us are so used to uh, using uh, uh, bclc that is the best and most validated prospectively validated system in the world in fact we have you know, i have we have if the time permits and if dr vivek and dr govin permit me we have designed our own algorithm which is much easier than bclc i think the moderator permit permit will show them our own uh, staging system do you have it up, up, uh, with you now or can I you have it later at the end can, of the talk yeah at the end of the talk okay sir then one more question one more question is the time for one more question dr govin yeah, yeah. yes yes please yes please yeah can we use uh, this is from varnasi by dr piyush takur can we use bclc classification non cirrhotic hcc as ibclc no. requires etp score you see a non cirrhotic hcc is a totally different ball game if you if you want i can present data on that it typically occurs within larger forms most of the time by the time it presents the lesions are larger alpha fetoprotein is typically not elevated most of them do not invade the vascular pattern because the liver function is preserved surgery is primarily the answer but in terms of radiological changes there is nothing much to choose they will have the same radiological features whether they are in cirrhosis or non cirrhosis one more question from trivandrum dr sunil raviraj my relative is hcv related cirrhosis child a and men 11 with an afp of 170 age is not given ultrasound did not show any space occupying lesion but ct dynamic review for a 9 mm dysplastic nodule what should we do now should we do an mri now or should we wait for one month then to reach a yeah see if i have shown you very good algorithm of uh, 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 management of a lesion which is less than one centimeter. But here the problem is this AFP is hundred and seventy. Yeah, I am coming to that. Only caveat you have is a raised alpha fetoprotein. Now you should understand raised alpha fetoprotein can also occur in an active inflammation, which may be occurring because of the hepatitis B and C. So in a situation like this, I'll see whether the patient has a replicative marker or not. If the patient has an ongoing replication evidence in the form of hepatitis C replicative status, then you can follow up of these patients. Uh, if the rna is negative then i'll go in for another modality like mri or ceci to confirm it up to 1 cm theoretically you can leave it alone and let it come to 2 cm because it has been shown that if you try to intervene prior to 2 cm there is no more advantage beyond 2 cm there is an exponential rise so there is no harm in waiting and coming back with uh, uh, coming back with another ct after 3 months Yeah, I think we we'll go on now with your presentation, uh, okay. Professor Alorora. I think we can take other questions at the uh, nearer the end of your talk. Yeah, there are many more questions. We will have it later. The screen visible, sir? Yes. Okay. You saw the answer. Everybody answered size less than one centimeter. Answer is very clear. I think it is a simple one. Uh, the next uh, curative option is surgery in patient with hepatocellular carcinoma whenever a patient comes to you with a tumor as a hepatologist two things are important to understand what is the number and extent of the lesion which can be assessed by the dynamic ct scan or pet or whatever you want to do and secondly you have to assess the child status of the disease by a meld score or a ctp score so whenever you want to operate on a patient with hepatocellular carcinoma with a cure to With an intent, with an intent to cure the patient, this is what you have to satisfy. Peri-op mortality has to be less than three percent. 
morbidity should be less than 20% and the chance of post op liver failure should be less than 5% this can be achieved if you have a ctp of less than ctp of a or meld of less than 10 so this is what we decide whether the patient has portal hypertension or not if the patient has no portal hypertension and if you are doing a major resection then you have a intermediate risk if you have evidence of portal hypertension then minor resection minor resection is characterized by less than 3 segment resection whereas major resection is characterized as any patient undergoing a surgery with with resection of more than 3 segments so there is a beautiful graph which shows that depending upon presence or absence of the portal hypertension and the meld score you are the total risk varies it is extremely important to understand this risk before going in for surgical resection for curative attempt of hcc so if you are doing a minor resection no portal hypertension risk is minimal if you are doing a major resection that means you are removing three segments in a patient with a meld of more than 10 then more than 9 then you are having a significant risk of decompensation up to the tune of about 26 percent so the current recommendations are if you are having child a without clinically significant portal hypertension characterized as hvpg of more than 10 esophageal varices or splenomegaly or platelet count of less than 1 lakh so major resection should be done only if patient has child a without clinically significant portal hypertension whereas minor resection should be attempted only in child b and selected patient with clinically significant portal hypertension preferably given the choice if you have a good laparoscopic surgery uh, support there is good data to show that laparoscopic surgery is better than open surgery what about rfa versus local resection up to a size of 3 cm in fact it has been clearly shown in various meta analysis that up to a size of 3 cm local replicative re re uh, ablative therapies like uh, rfa can give you equally good result in terms of long term efficacy for management of curative intent in patient with uh, hepatocellular carcinoma third curative attempt is liver transplantation in patient with hepatocellular carcinoma in fact ideal treatment very well documented over almost 15 years from the french group is the first line option of milan's criteria and uh, which has shown excellent five year results to the tune of about 65 to 80% and this is also the reason why should we downgrade or bridge our patient back to milan criteria if you want to do the liver transplantation in fact but in patient with ldlt especially in setup like india where we have 80 percent of our transplantation are ldlt related we there is more liberal policy of using liver transplantation in ldlt and at least two other than milan ucsf criteria in some center has also been validated and this include uh, the criteria has shown that you have a lesion which is uh, uh, more than uh, uh, less than 6.5 centimeter and the single lesion has to be less than 5 centimeters so milan and ucsf criteria can be taken up in selected center in uh, living donor liver transplantation in fact in the western world so called marginal donors are supposed to be equally good in ddlt program and these marginal donors are the donors who in which you have a living donor right lobe graft cadaveric split livers organs with tier 2 hepatitis and also the organs which have been retrieved from circular circulatory death donor as against brain dead donors living donor liver transplantation has a chance of recurrence of the disease and in fact the best results are obtained if you do the transplantation uh, within a within milan's criteria we will usually recommend that if the lesion is beyond milan criteria we should do a downstaging of the disease that gives you two advantage that you are doing it on a uh, criteria which has been prospectively validated but it also gives you time to study the biology of the disease most of these patients with hepatocellular carcinoma uh, who undergo liver transplantation do need a regular follow-up because there is an inc incidental recurrence of uh, tumor in about 8 to 20 percent of the patient and most of these patients tend to recur within the first two years and majority of the recurrences are within the liver and they tend to occur because of the reactivation of the underlying uh, liver disease or metastasis which has been missed previously rather than the de novo metastasis next stage of management is bclcb that means you have a multinodular lesion which is not resectable but fortunately for us patient is still as having preserved liver function and ecog status is good so we need to have a local regional therapy. 
classical local regional therapy is called TACE, that is trans arterial chemoembolization, which involves catheter based delivery of the chemotherapeutic agents followed by injection of the embolic material so as to decrease the arterial flow. So these are the various embolic agents and the chemotherapeutic agents which are available in the market, which are used in day-to-day -day practice in interventional radiology. Suffice to, to say that a new drug called idrarubicin has the maximum potential. It is still being tried in phase three trials. This has the maximum activity in vitro against the hepatocellular carcinoma. So there are various types of uh, tastes which can be done, conventional taste versus drug eluting beads, and in conventional taste also, depending on which particular part of the artery you are going to embolize and cause ischemia, the results can improve. The indications of taste, uh, taste are that all patients who are having a BCLC stage, intermediate stage, or those patients with BCLC A, in which the ablative therapy or resection therapy have lead, led to stage migration and there is a recurrence of the disease, or patient in advanced stage of the disease in the child, uh, in the uh, larger tumors who need to be downgraded to be brought back, back to the Milan criteria. These are the indications for taste. But if the patient has a CTP of more than eight, extensive main portal vein thrombosis, creatinine of more than two, or extensive tumor involving both legs, this should not be undergoing taste. We recently published our results in subgroup, selected subgroup of the patient who underwent taste even with portal vein thrombosis. Another advantage of using TACE is that you can either downstage the tumor, that means you bring the tumor to within, within Milan's criteria, or bridge the tumor if the waiting pe period for DDLT program is more than three months, so that there is no increase in the size of the tumor, because the larger the tumor, the more, more broke progress with the tumor prior to liver transplantation, higher will be the chances of the recurrence after liver transplantation. With downstaging and bridging, what you are trying to achieve is a 100% necrosis, which unfortunately is possible only in 30% of the cases. So there is, uh, this is cases associated with complication. Most of them are easily manageable. We presented our audit in about 300 patients undergoing case in our center, which showed relatively good results. There is no added advantage of uh, drug eluting bead, though the theoretical advantage is that if you are using beads as carrier agent of chemotherapeutic agent, the side effects will be less because small amount of the chemotherapeutic drug is released at a time. But prospective trials have not shown the benefit of drug eluting bead over and above the conventional states. There is one score called HAP score, that is Hepatoma Arterial Embolization Prognostic Score which tells you what is the outcome of the uh, taste. So a combination of albumin, alpha fetoprotein, bilirubin, and maximum tumor size. Very easy to understand, larger the tumor, higher the alpha fetoprotein, more the albumin, lesser the chance that the taste will be successful, the chances of recurrence will be very high. Another vascular modality is called transit arterial radioembolization or tear. Advantage is, is that you are using microspheres which travel deep into the smallest possible possible capillaries because the size is only 35 micron. And since the hepatocellular carcinomas are lying just the, in the vicinity of this distal capillary venule, so you have these uh, beta emitting uh, microspheres, which can be very effective in management of hepatocellular carcinoma. Important thing to note is that you are not causing ischemic injury to the uh, liver and hence theoretically it should have more advantages as compared to uh, Taste. But the problem with the uh, tear is that none of the guidelines has still recommended it over and above the taste. The reason is that it is possible to do tear only in about two thirds of the patients who are eligible for it because if there is a shunting of the blood away from the liver or if there is a history of biliary obstruction, tear cannot be done. There, is, there are some studies which have tried to look at the advantage of combining taste with systemic therapies. Unfortunately, none of them have shown any benefit. But the TACTIS trial has recently suggested that if you do not use m resist criteria for follow-up patient with HCC, there is some advantage of using sorafenib over and above TACE. Finally, coming to the systemic therapies in patients who are having in the stage C, that means there is an extension of the tumor into the portal vein, or if there is evidence of the extra hepatic spread, but, but still the performance status is less than two. What do we do in such condition? There are extensive ways of Development of HCC, how many tumor 
factors you can block is not easy to understand. And hence, you look at the timeline of develop, development of the systemic therapies in hepatic cellular carcinoma. But just to summarize, we took 30 years to discover the first drug as a first-line therapy of HCC, that is sorafenib. Subsequently, we took another 10 years to develop the second first-line drug, that is lenvatinib. But then, if as a hepatologist, I look at it, survival advantage is only three months. Is that not a food for thought for us as hepatologists? So what do uh, what do these multi, multi uh, what do these TKIs tell us? They tell us that minimum dose required is around 800 milligram per day. Only 15 percent of the patient do not tolerate these disease. In 35 percent, you have to reduce the dose. Overall response rate, as seen on M resist, is only 10 percent, and advantage you get is only 3 percent. So this is the second line drug which have come. So if the first line does not work, second line can be used as cabozanitinib, rigorafenib, or remucirumab. If the disease is progressing and the patient is tolerating the drug, then rigorafenib. If the disease is progressing in a patient who is not tolerating, then you can use the cabozanitinib, and then there is a, some role of immunotherapy. So what is the basis of immunotherapy? So this is something I think it's important to understand because most of the new upcoming therapies will have immune check inhibition. So let's look at what is happening in patients who have tumor. So if you have a tumor, it will have a, it will release an antigen called tumor antigen, which will be processed by the dendritic cell, which will be presented to the MHC cell, that is major stroke compatibility antigen. Now this antigen, I, this cell, ideally should look at the T cell, try to activate the T cell, which will in effect kill the tumor cell. But what happens in before? activation of the T cell, you need to have stimulation of the post-stimulatory molecule, especially in the form of CD80. So this CD80 of the dendritic cell has to come in contact with the CD28 of the T cell. Unfortunately, CTAL4, which is an inhibitory molecule, tends to block the attachment of the CD80 to CD28. So what you can do is you can get a anti ctal 4 antibody. That is a classical epilumab in treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma. And then once you have activated the cytotoxic T cell, how is it that is going to kill the tumor cell? You need to have a combination of the T antigen expressed onto the T cell receptor, which will then identify tumor cells. But for that identification, you need to have free PD-1 sites. Unfortunately, tumor is very smart. It tends to produce these ligands called PD-L1, which tend to block PD-1. So if you can antagonize either PD-1 by nivolumab or pembrolizumab, or you try to undo PD-L1 uh, agonism by duralumab, this is the time when you have T cell which will secrete the enzymes called perforin and granizine, which are going to kill the cell. So this is the concept of the immune checkpoint inhibitors which are available in the market, which are going to be available soon in the market. And only yesterday evening, this was a publication on 19th May 2020 from New England Journal of Medicine, a combination of atizolizumab and vivacizumab in resectable carcinoma gives you a 15-month survival. Radiotherapy has a limited role. So, uh, EZL and ESLD still are not convinced about the utility in patients with hepatocellular carcinoma. We tend to use it in subgroup of the patient who have tumor thrombosis in hepatocellular carcinoma. And finally, in patients who have hepatocellular carcinoma, as I said, unless we prevent them with lifestyle modification, stopping consumption of alcohol, hepatitis B vaccination, and treating hepatitis B and C, you cannot prevent HCC. Look at this slide. Just by hepatitis B vaccination, you have a 70% reduction of HCC. So if you treat with nucleoside analogs, DEAs in HCV, stop alcohol, do the activity, take uh, aspirin, you have a substantial reduction of HCC. This is extremely important. And finally, coming on to the role of uh, coffee, con clear answers from uh, easel and the ASLD recommendation, two extra cups of coffee, they decrease the oxidative stress and decrease the, there is a 30% reduction in risk of hepatocellular carcinoma in patients who drink at least two cups of the coffee per day. And in future lies in uh, the early marker that is liquid biopsy. This is the publication from Dr. Arun Sanyal, which I have partly answered earlier. A combination of number of uh, um, tumor associated protein biomarkers as well as mutation in 1933 distinct genomic 
patterns which can be picked up in extracellular vesicle both in the blood and urine gives you 98 to 98 percent sensitivity and specificity for diagnosis of early hcc so with that uh, uh, if the chair permits can i ask two questions sir absolutely yes please so the first question is nivolumab is the immune checkpoint inhibitor which acts at ctl4 begf pd1 pdl1 Dr. Govind, can I move to the next question? No, we, let's see the response to, to this, so we can have a response uh, from Amol to see that uh, what is the response like from audience. Yes, Amol, you can share your screen. So, so, so everyone said almost uh, uh, seventy, sixty uh, percent said PDL one, PDL one. Nivolumab is not PDL one; it is PD one. Okay. And uh, uh, and. Uh, Amol, can you show the slide once more? I think did I read wrong? Amol, can you show the slide again? Uh, yes. So, so this is a this one PD one is a uh, response. Almost sixty uh, percent is PD one. Anyway. Yeah, that's good. So I think my explanation was good enough. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, then uh, we uh, move on to the next question. Next question is a patient who was on sorafenib, eight hundred milligram per day, developed significant side effects and disease progression. So, as per the EASL ASLD guideline, what should be the second line systemic therapy? As a treatment of choice, answers are lenalidomide, cabozanitinib, rigorafenib, or continuous sorafenib. And we have answer, please. Yes. So, so answer that uh, the corona fever. Twenty-six percent, twenty-five percent, almost to fifty percent. Inclusion criteria for rigora fever was subgroup of the patient who tolerated sorafenib. For at least 28 days prior to the start of the trial, in a dose of at least 400 milligram a day. So, if you are sorafenib tolerant and disease progression, answer is rigorafenib. Can I Perfect. move on, sir? And finally, to summarize, hepatocellular carcinoma is the leading cause of cancer-related mortality and incidence is rising. Surveillance of patient at risk for hepatocellular carcinoma should be carried out by ultrasonography every six months. Lesion less than two centimeter. If you have the advantage of the hepatospecific contrast agent like the doxic acid, acid and the advantage of using DWI, that is the best modality for diagnosis of HCC less than two centimeter. Surgery is the treatment of choice for very early HCC and HCC in non-serotic patients. Also, there is no role of adjuvant chemotherapy after that. Radio frequency ablation is equal to surgery for all lesions less than three centimeters. If they are candidate for surgery, taste is the modality of choice for uh, for BCLC B as well as for downstage or bridge the therapy. Milan criteria is the most definitive and prospectively validated criteria for selection of the patient for liver transplantation. Eight to twenty percent of these patients are likely to recur after liver transplantation. Most of the patients with portal vein thrombosis. Cannot undergo TACE, and hence TAIR can be an alternative therapy, and TAIR can be used in addition to uh, radiotherapy in patients who have a portal vein thrombosis and uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. Systemic therapies do have a limited role, at least to my knowledge. There is an increasing role of immunotherapy, which has been promising over the last eight to nine months. 
and prevention of HCV is extremely important as 80% of the HCC can be uh, prevented. And finally, with the availability of liquid biopsies in molecular genetics, we may be able to diagnose HCC much earlier in patients with hepatocellular carcinoma. To end up, sir, optimism is the faith that leads to achievement. Nothing can be done without hope and confidence. With that, I'll hand over the stage back to the organizers. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Anil, for a masterly overview in the short time of uh, this extensive topic of hepatocellular carcinoma. You've covered many areas, including the recent uh, progress on uh, uh, newer drugs and combinations and diagnostics. And as is to be expected, you have a flood of questions to answer. Can I, can I, can I questions have come algorithm, out. if uh, you allow me? Uh, you, I mean, I think what we could, uh, if you could have been nice if you had got it into your talk, because I think about 150 okay. questions that okay. have to be um, addressed. We would like to have some time for the people who have been yeah. working hard to put very difficult questions to you. So I think I'll just divide them into a few categories. I'll take about uh, five or uh, seven questions and then uh, Dr. Um, Jan, uh, Ajay Jan will have more questions for you. You can use the so the you can can difficult answers. questions for yourself. Right. So I think in terms of uh, uh, diagnosis, people want to know what is the benefit of combinations of markers like AFP, AFP, L3 and PIVCA? Uh, does it increase the screening sensitivity? Is it cost effective? What are your thoughts? This is Ravi yeah. Thakur from Banaras Varanasi wanted to know. It, it has no role in diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma. But when you plan therapy like surgical excision, tear, tear or liver transplantation, it does have a role. Biggest advantage of using DCP and alpha fetoprotein fraction, L3 fraction, is to characterize the lesion which are likely to recur have poor prognosis and may be unfit for liver transplantation. Most of these patients who have positive markers like uh, DCP and alpha fetoprotein L3 fraction are uh, having poorly differentiated carcinoma. They do have no role in diagnosis, but certainly in management, they are of benefit. Okay, thank you. And I think Dr. Ravichandra from Hyderabad, Ravichandra wants to know, how will you differentiate a multicentric HCC from a single HCC which has metastasized to multiple lobes of the liver. Multiple intrahepatic metastases of an HCC. Yeah, I think the best, I told you in terms of specificity of the lesion, all three lesions are is specifically picked up by CT, MRI and EUS. So whether the patient has a one lesion which has metastasized as multiple metastases, there is no way to know unless you have a previous ultrasound or CT scan or MRI, which shows that there was one lesion which has gone up. So multicentricity of the lesion in one scan cannot be documented. Right. But if you have one large lesion and multiple small lesions, would that uh, change things? Yes. It's, see, well, it's very important. The ultimate ultimate success of any treatment depends upon whether you have a satellite nodules. Satellite nodule, nodules, perivascular invasion do portend a poor prognosis. That is exactly the where, uh, where the role of DCP and alpha fetoprotein fraction L3 comes in. Even if there are no satellite nodules, if on biochemically you can pick up these markers, these indicate more likely recurrence of the lesion. That means what you are seeing macroscopically, you may have more microscopical also. Right. So, okay. And I think Dr. Ravichandra also wants to know that in a non-serotic HCC, is our imaging criteria sufficient or you still need the help of tissue diagnosis in the absence of cirrhosis? All patients with non-serotic non HCC cannot be diagnosed in the absence of biopsy. Radiologically, the features look like the same, but the radiological criteria has been specified only for cirrhosis and cirrhosis alone. I did specify in my talk, there are three requisites. You need to have an underlying cirrhosis, you need to have a lesion more than one centimeter, and you need to have a arterial enhancement at venous washout to say it radiologically. Right. right. So you do need tissue in cases of non-serotic um, suspicion of HCC. Uh, Doctor, again, uh, Ravichandra has a lot of imaging questions. He wants to know uh, the cutoff value for fibroscan in a patient with cirrhosis alone versus cirrhosis plus HCC. Do the cutoffs uh, change or does fibroscan help you in making a uh, suspecting HCC? See, absolutely. We, in fact, if you see in clinical practice, you hardly look at a fibroscan once you have a CT and MRI. 
it has no more advantage diagnosis of hcc has nothing to do with the fibro scan as i said in hepatitis b and c advanced fibrosis can also lead to presence of uh, uh, hcc even in the absence of the cirrhosis so we never look at fibro scan to see whether the patient has hcc or not because there is enough specificity available by three modalities ceus ct scan and mri right okay uh, um... I think there are some several people, particularly Dr. Suprabha Giri from Mumbai, Rinkesh Bansal from Gurgaon, and a couple of others wanted to know about the Hong Kong uh, HKLC versus the Barcelona Clinic and the Hong Kong Clinic liver can cancer scores. In the context of Indian patients, uh, how do you rate them? Would HKLC score above BCLC? Yeah, you see, is that as I tell, I have um, already mentioned that in Indian scenario, we have. major chunk of our liver transplantation is ldlt in ddlt you have a milans criteria which has been most prospectively validated there are some centers which have also validated ucsf criteria there are centers in india which do not look at any of these criteria and according to them any lesion which is within the liver if it has not invaded the portal vein if there is no extra hepatic spread on mri ct or uh, uh, pet scan then the size and the location does not matter but these have not been prospectively validated but i will agree with the this uh, this notion that if the patient child status is okay and if you have a living donor if there is no macroscopic invasion then you can bypass this conventional criteria and can go beyond ucs so bottom line your hklc in which situations and bclc in which in these situations bclc as i said in fact you can go beyond bclc in ldlt setting ldlt oh. setting you don't need to be restricted to the to right. milan or ucsf you can go well beyond ucsf also but then that has to be prospectively evaluated if you look, look at the easel 2018 guidelines they clearly show anything beyond it needs you, it's not that you should not do it but then you should prospectively validate it especially in the external center rather than at a given center Okay, I'll ask you two quick questions about surveillance, and then hand over to Dr. Ajay Jain for his set of questions. So, Dr. Alok from Jalandhar wants to know regarding HCC surveillance in post-SVR HCV cirrhosis, hepatitis C liver cirrhosis post-SVR. Should it be any different from what you have suggested? Should it be more frequent because people have this impression that HCC is picked up more often in the post-SVR HCV group? no it should not be done more frequently but it should not be done less frequently also in fact if you see when dea came into the market i think dr vivek was with me in the easel meeting in barcelona there was a uh, path breaking abstract from judy bor judy borix from uh, uh, from uh, spain which said that oh with the dea you have rapid increase in carcinoma but subsequently i think there is enough data to suggest that That's these are the, the patient which were possibly missed in the earlier Uh, and earlier diagnosis of hcc and then they later surfaced up there is a good data to show dea should not be restricted and withheld in patient with hcc in fact dea should be started right at the time of diagnosis of hcc there is increasing data to show that if you start dea at the time of diagnosis of hcc this only adds up in recovery of hcc and after the da has been achieved and the svr has been achieved there is a substantial reduction in development of hcc it's not that yeah, so basically the question was about surveillance not about da treatment so surveillance should be same as is uh, there in people it should be same it should not have no change in the uh, surveillance protocol surveillance after svr has been achieved right should not and be finally uh, when do you start surveillance in people with alcoholic cirrhosis and nash cirrhosis or people in nash even without cirrhosis what are your guidelines for surveillance in these people in fact uh, you see there is a criteria of uh, efficacy of surveillance which tells you the incidence of disease and the cost effectiveness of surveillance in in cirrhosis of the liver if you are having 1.5% incidence that becomes cost effective which is calculated by two parameters that is a increase in the life by about 100 days at a cost of 50000 us dollars per year of the life saved now at cirrhotics do fit in with that criteria hepatitis b fits in with that criteria whereas nash fits at a borderline criteria the incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma in nash is to the tune of about 0.3% per year and the cost effectiveness comes to the question 
I think just stick to the surveillance strategy. What should be the surveillance strategy in NASH, non-serotic and uh, NASH cirrhosis? Yes, in NASH cirrhosis, the criteria is the same as in other cirrhosis. In NASH, right. in the absence of the cirrhosis, there is, it is left to the individual. As I said, I'm giving you the justification. Why should you do it or why you should not do it? Up to 0.2% mm -hmm. per year is justified to use it with the conventional available cost effectiveness. And in HCC, it is 0.3. But still, it is left to the individual because there are so many other factors which affect the outcome, including the metabolic syndrome, diabetes, etc. in NASH. So I think, uh, uh, Dr. Ajay Jain, if uh, you are ready with your questions, please uh, yeah. ask them for Dr. Arora. Yeah. Uh, the question from Dr. Varghese from Trivandrum. He wants to know role of nanoparticle technology in the diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, there is, as of, to my knowledge, none of the guidelines do mention that I have not come across any technology like that. What is important, which I mentioned to you, is the, the liquid biopsy recently published by Arun Sanyal. The next question is by Dr. Saxena from Delhi. He wants to know, is the management of hepatocellular carcinoma different in a pregnant female? In? Pregnant females. In pregnant females? Yeah. Uh, the only, most of the therapies which can be given in hepatocellular carcinoma management be it radiation, be it taste, tear or surgery, will be contraindicated in pregnant women. So, systemic therapies have not been allowed to be used in pregnant women. So, you will have very limited options. Only thing which can be done is taste, uh, only thing which can be done is an RFA in pregnant women, which may not be a contraindication. Short of that, radiation and surgery certainly will not be indicated in pregnant women. So, next question is uh, by Dr. Abhiman Pawar from Sangli. He wants to know what precautions one has to take using immune checkpoint inhibitors in post-transplant metastasis as these drugs stimulate T cells whereas patient needs immune suppression to prevent rejection. In fact, after transplantation, there was some suggestion that if you use drugs like Evorolimus, so that is a mTOR inhibitor and gives you better results. But as of today, immunosuppression has been clearly shown to have no relevance in terms of progression or regression of the disease. Earlier it was thought if you give mTOR inhibitors like your it will give you some advantage, but it has not been proven in subsequent studies. So you don't need to shift your immunosuppression. The next question is by Dr. Prokhar from Varanasi. And he wants to know the role of stereotactic radiotherapy in locally advanced hepatocellular carcinoma. Can we throw some light on it? And also whether it can be combined with other well-established therapies. The SBRT, uh, I had uh, skipped some of the slides because of the want of the time. Because by default, it is a radio-sensitive tumor. HC is a radio-sensitive tumor. So in our indication for use of SBRT are the location of the tumor which is primarily in the hilum and the tumor which is infiltrating into the portal vein. So to portal vein tumor thrombosis with hilar lesion which is unfit for taste is the best candidate for uh, SBRT. In fact, there have also been trials to use SBRT as a primary, primary standalone therapy in earlier stages of HCC like child in the BCLC A and B. But these have not been prospectively confirmed and guidelines do not suggest it. So we are using it in subgroup of the patient, hyalur lesion, unfit for uh, taste with tumor portal vein thrombosis. There are a lot of questions regarding the role of PET-SCED in the diagnosis and management of uh, HCC. A lot of questions, less than one centimeter lesion, what is the role of PET, lesion between two to three centimeter uh, role of PET. So can you throw some light, what is the exact role of pet -SCED? then in the diagnosis and management of uh, HCC. PET scan, I have told you, it has absolutely no role in early HCC. No, no confusion about it. Best way to diagnose early HCC is MRI. I have shown you clear images. It has the best sensitivity, especially if you use two types of additional advantages over and above the con typical contrast agent. One of them modality is called hepatobiliary contrast. So this is a contrast called the doxytic acidic contrast. Advantage of this contrast is 
in, a, in, in addition to give you extracellular component, it gives you a hepatobiliary stage. So in, in extracellular component, you are looking at the hyper enhancement, that is the vascularity of the tumor. And in the hepatobiliary phase, you are looking at the characteristics of HCC. Biggest advantage of this type of contrast is that in a dysplastic nodule, you will have complete receptor and transporters which will pick up the contrast and put it into the biliary tract. But the moment you have hepatocellular carcinoma, there will be no picking up of this contrast and then draining into the biliary duct. So by T2 imaging, if there is an HCC, it can beautifully be differentiated from this plastic nodule because of the functioning capacity of the gadoxytic acid. Uh, another question is by Dr. Prakhar from Varanasi. And he wants to know, does statin use along with new RDAs reduce the chance of hepatocellular carcinoma development? in those patients who have HBV or HCV as etiology. In the, in the penultimate slide which I've showed you, the risk reduction with the various modalities, including abstinence of alcohol, hepatitis B and C, even though it is claimed that statins do decrease the portal pressure and fibrosis, but there is no quantitative risk reduction of HCC in addition to DEA and HCV, no documented data. But then hepatitis B treatment, HCV treatment, alcohol abstinence, and aspirin do have reduction in different type of uh, etiologically related malignancies. So one of the questions, I'm forgetting the name of the gentleman who asked, how does coffee works in prevention of HCC? How does? Coffee works in the prevention of HCC. As, which one? Coffee, coffee. Coffee, yeah. yeah. Coffee, uh, you see there is data, I, uh, because of the one and I skipped the slides. What it does is, is it stimulates the MAPK3 kinase and ERK2 kinase, thereby decreasing the oxidative stress. If you remember one of the slides I showed you, that the etiological agents can cause HCC either via the inflammatory cascade or directly by changing the genetic and epigenetic milieu of the cell. So when they are doing via inflammation, they go through a process of DNA destabilization, injury to the mitochondria and oxidative stress. That is where the coffee acts convincingly shown that there is a 35% reduction. And that is the reason Ezel has clearly recommended that if you drink more than two coffees per day, it does decrease. So, so the corollary to that is if a person is taking an alcohol every day, does he take two coffees every day will reduce the chances of excess? I think maybe <laughs> you'll have to drink both and see. <laughs> so a couple of last questions. Uh, Dr. Deepak Bhangle from Kochi wants to know, the checkpoint inhibitors are known to cause hepatotoxicity. So how safe is to use them in HCC? Yeah, I think it's an important question. If you look at the phase three trial, check maze 4759 trial, it has not shown any more advantage over and above uh, the use of sorafenib. If you see, uh, the uh, US FDA had given a conditional approval based on phase two trials, but phase three trials have not shown advantages over and above sorafenib. So we are back to the square one. And uh, I agree 30% of the time if you have hepatotoxicity, it is a big issue because you are not only treating hepatocellular carcinoma in total, it is you are doing it on an underlying cirrhosis. And most of the time the cirrhosis is advanced by the time you have these lesions. Last question from my side, because this is again has been asked by a large number of people, is more uh, the role of PIVKA, that is a vitamin K associated tumor marker, in the screening of HCC. There are about 15 odd people have asked this question. Which marker? PIFCA. Uh, P -I PIFCA. Yeah, PIFCA. Yeah. PIFCA is same as DCP. I told you, this is the desk carboxy prothrombin. It is an altered form of prothrombin. PIFCA 2 and DCP is the same thing. Very okay. clear answer. It has less sensitivity, more specificity. It tells you that there is a satellite nodule. You are more likely to have poorly differentiated tumor. You are more likely to have vascular invasion. So no role in diagnosis, excellent role in prognosis, surgery, recurrence, transplantation. Last question. Please guide us in treating HCC in pediatric age group. This is by Dr. Sunil Raviraj from Trivandrum. I, I have no experience. I'll not be <laughs> Okay, so because well, think... there have been a, a lot of uh, requests that people want you to share your uh, HCC algorithm. We have a few minutes in hand, two, three minutes before we have to wind up. So could you quickly take people through your um, algorithm for HCC? Uh, yeah, I will have to, yeah, I think get back to the slide. Can I take one minute? Yeah. Okay.
I'll just take one. Meanwhile, it is the question is now two hundred and thirteen. Two one three. So, <laughs> lots of <laughs> lots of homework. Answers. Lots of homework for Anil. Yeah. You answered a fair number. He must have answered about over twenty twenty five questions in the three sessions. But um, uh, still about two a one fifth one eighty one ninety questions for you to deal at home. Uh, there was one yeah. question that stands out. Can I ask it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, please. Yeah. What is the legal aspect of starting treatment without biopsy? Without this biopsy. This is just a doctor from Chennai. No name. A doctor from Chennai has asked. That's why. See, it is a prospectively validated study. Why are you worried about it? If this is the only diagnosis which can be made radiologically. So there is no legality. So far as you satisfy all the criteria, where is the problem of legality? Probably somebody has given a case against you. <laughs> um, if you are confident, if you know your subject, you don't need to be afraid about it. Yeah. So this is the uh, proposed classification. Can you see the screen, please? See the screen, please. Is the screen available? Yes. Yes. So, uh, what we have proposed these criteria, which we are going to publish and have the opinion of everybody. So, I think the best way to look at HCC after going through the whole gamut is, as the patient walks to you, just ask him a simple question: What is the PS? What is the performance status? If PS is more than two, I have shown you the various, you know, caricatures and diagram of how to look at the PS. PS2 would mean that you are not going to office, you are stationed at home, and you are in bed more than 50% of the time. So in this patient, nothing can be done. The patient needs a supportive care. That is the question number one. Once patient has a PS of two, or less than two, that is performance status of less than two, you ask the patient, because patient will come to you with a CT and MRI. You look at the record and see if the patient has an extra hepatic spread or no extra hepatic spread. If the patient has extra hepatic spread, nothing can be done. Again, patient is pulled into a medical therapy or other thing which I'll come to. If the patient has no extra hepatic spread, third question you have to ask him whether the uh, patient has a, a lesion within the Milan criteria or outside the Milan criteria. If the patient's lesion is within Milan criteria, we can ask him all of them to come to get a downgrading done and come back come back to Milan's criteria. All everybody within Milan criteria should be offered a liver transplantation. If they can do it, well and good. If they cannot do it, 80% of them cannot do it. Then you look at the size of the tumor. If the tumor is less than three centimeter, ablate. Three to point five cent, three to five centimeter, ablation and taste more than five centimeter. Look at the clinically significant portal hypertension. More than uh, if the, there is CSPH, then you do. Case and if it, there is no CSPH, you can go in for surgery. And if the downstaging is not possible in patient who come to you with an advanced disease, look at the CTP. If the CTP is more than eight, nothing can be done. If the CTP is less than eight, then there are two options of either medical therapy or taste. And finally, in medical therapy, first line is always sorafenib. After sorafenib, if the patient is tolerant, continue sorafenib. If the patient is sorafenib non-responded but tolerant, that means patient has no side effects but the tumor increases, then switch on to rigorafenib. If the patient neither tolerates nor responds, then you can choose any of these. So with three simple, four, four, three to four simple question, you can get back to a clear answer sitting in the OPD also. Well, excellent. I think Anil, that covers it very well. And um, uh, with this, I think we come to the end of your presentation, which I'm sure has been thoroughly enjoyed by all of us. And uh, Govind, I'm sure you are there. Can you please uh, uh, do the honors uh, for the closing thing and the, a lot of information you give us at the end of the talk? So one more question, last question, if I can ask you. Uh, uh, Chandrakant from AIG uh, Hyderabad has asked, 
uh, there's a poor consensus on SCC. Yeah. So you have uh, not mentioned that. So he wants to know that does it apply to our country? What do I follow? But the problem is, I'll tell you, to be honest, you know, the problem is we do not have a national database. If the patient goes to an international radiologist or a surgeon, they, at least in the private sector, he'll not be allowed to come back to a hepatologist ever. International radiologists will keep the patient to them. Hepatologists will keep it to them. So where is the national data collection? I think unless you have a national database to have your own recommendation based on uh, just review of the literature does not uh, mean anything. So what I have given is what we practice in day-to-day -day basis. And uh, this is what is applied in real world of type of practice. All right. More stronger, you know, third party audited database. It is not available. And this is what I'll suggest. I think people at your level can take it up. Uh, I think uh, all of us will appreciate your recommendation for two cup of coffee every day. Uh, probably uh, that will save you from your liver cancer. Anyway, uh, thank you, Dr. Aura, for a wonderful talk. I would say mastery talk to giving algorithms for defining SCC. How do you make a diagnosis? How do you approach? And how do you treat uh, SCC? This was a masterly delivered talk. Thank you so much and many congratulations to you, Dr. Arora. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Jen and Dr. Krishna Das for moderating this session. Uh, we had uh, almost 210 questions and uh, Dr. Saraswat, Dr. Krishna Das and Dr. Jen uh, took many of, the, many of these questions and uh, many of them are still uh, not answered. So these questions we are going to send to you uh, if you can work on these questions uh, and uh, uh, our viewers get benefit out of it. As all of you know that uh, all these uh, master classes are, uh, are archived in ISG library which you, you can access uh, by going to ISG website and uh, you can see all these lectures out there. In addition to that uh, you have asked many questions and we have tried to, uh, to uh, we, and all the most of the speakers have uh, already responded to many of our questions, so you can also look to those to answers to the question you already asked. With this, uh, we close today's session. But before uh, we close, Sophie, could you uh -huh. okay? Yeah, please uh, update them uh, about the uh, upcoming yeah. series. So before uh, we close, uh, there are a couple of things to to I want we want to let you know that uh, we are con going to continue master classes. The the we plan for master classes. The last talk is. Uh, next uh, Sunday, that is on uh, May 24th, uh, 12 to 1, our usual time on Sunday. That's a talk on how do you approach to a patient with uh, chronic constipation. And we know that uh, chronic constipation is a very, very important topic for not only for gastroenterologists, but uh, physicians and in fact, any medical doctor, the constipation is one of the very important, uh, 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 very important disease where they see a lot of patients. So we, next talk will be on chronic constipation approach uh, on Sunday 12 to 1. We are extending our master classes uh, uh, to many further weeks and we have uploaded already the schedule for next four master classes and you can see uh, we will continue master classes but not twice a week but once a week. We have been doing on Wednesday and, and Sunday but now let, lockdown is getting open, hospitals are getting uh, ready to, to, to start the full scale work. Therefore, we are uh, dropping the Wednesday session and we continue with only Sunday sessions, 12 to 1 on the usual time. And we have already uploaded a, a lecture of four lecture series uh, on Masterclass website. Uh, with this, uh, uh, we close. We say bye bye to all of you. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Arora, for a masterly talk. Thank you, Dr. Saraswat. Thank you, Dr. Krishnadas. Thank you, Dr. Jain. Thank you, technical team, for Again, wonderful relay uh, of the today's talk. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Ramesh, Mr. Amol, and Yogita for all the support all along. Thank With you. this, bye-bye, and see you on Sunday, 12 to 1. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye, all. Bye-bye.